Welcome to our next episode of Coffee and Conversation AI in Healthcare. My name is Michał Urbanowicz. I'm a medical doctor and a senior marketing manager at Informedica. And today with me today is Dr. Dominique Pimenta, a CEO of Tartus, where you are building a next generation AI co-pilot uh, for physicians on a mission to reduce the number of medical errors, but also uh, a keen Python develop developer, fundraiser, former clinical lead for cardiology at Orca, the organization for the review of care and health apps, and uh, much, much more. Uh, welcome, and it's my pleasure to have you uh, with us today. Fantastic, and thanks thanks very much for inviting me. Yeah, and uh, based on your then your based on your extensive experience, uh, let's maybe just jump straight into our conversation sure. uh, on AI in healthcare. Um, so my first question, my first topic to you would be, um, how do you see the integration of AI and digital health technologies reshaping patient care? And what ethical considerations do you prioritize in development and deployment of AI solutions in the healthcare sector? Yeah, for sure. So I think what's super interesting is like the AI space to answer your first question, specifically about AI, really. I've done some other digital health work, but I think AI is where things get quite interesting. That's why I spend all my time. So maybe I'll chit chat about that a little bit. Um, so for a little bit of background, I used to be an AI academic researcher and when we were looking at, across the AI space about where AI had really delivered in healthcare, it, you know, if you look at the 750 plus FDA approved algorithms, more than 60% are in radiology, more than 50% of the other 50% uh, are actually in cardiology in, in a radiology space, mm -hmm. which is labeled a different specialty. So it's always been about structured data. It's almost always been about imaging. And I think what's really interesting is if you look at where imaging sits in the clinical pathway in general. So if you go back 200 years to William Osler, the father of modern medicine, he said something along the lines of, listen to the patient. They are telling you what is wrong. And what he meant was the history that actually listening to the patient, taking the symptoms, eliciting the history from the patient is the single most important part of the diagnostic process. And in fact, that unit is the most important part of any healthcare system. The right diagnosis at the right time is always the most costly and efficient way of, uh, you know, any pathway. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. And that's really interesting because that still remains true today. So there was a study about four or five years ago in 2012 that looked at if you take the history, talking to the patient, the examination, examining them, and imaging and tests, where is the most highest diagnostic yield? And still 75% is in the history alone. And what's fascinating is that in the healthcare as industry, that's always been unstructured data, relatively inaccessible. You're relying on the doctor's notes, which are pretty terrible and very time constrained. So suddenly in the era of large language models and ambient and using a lot of speech to text AI, suddenly we now have access to a part of the healthcare process that we never really did. And I think that's where we'll see massive change in how we manage that data, what we do with that data, who's responsible for inputting it, we'll move away from the physician and back to a digital function. And our vision is really actually to a digital worker, to an AI that will be responsible for curating the most important parts of the data. And then the insights that we can get from that will massively improve everything from diagnostics to coding to billing, simply because it's the truth. It's not an abstraction of the truth, it's actually what is happening in the room. So I think that, you know, large language models will unlock a, a massive change. And I think we haven't really even started to contemplate how big that change might be, not just augmenting the workflows that we have right now, but potentially changing them entirely and allowing, you know, patients and AI to interact before they see the clinician. And then that becomes part of the clinical workflow. I think your point about ethical considerations is, is extremely valid. And I think I would go slightly deeper and think, well, what is it now that we have issues with in medicine from an ethical standpoint that AI could make worse and AI could make better. I don't think we really think about the baseline. So really a uh, common question that we get asked about the models that we use and how we are appropriate is, you know, what is your approach to bias in the model? What is your approach to equity? And that's a very interesting question if your main focus really is in large language models, which are probabilistic models, where actually, the, you know, the question of bias is, is is more philosophical it's not a mathematical uh function at all so 
but let's look at the system as it is today. So human beings being seen in, in human settings by human doctors. Currently, there's a lot of bias. A really good example of that is if you're a non-native language speaker. So if you don't speak the native language and you come into hospital, your chance of having a severely poor outcome in terms of morbidity and mortality is much higher than if you speak the native language. So there's already very significant bias in the system that we have. And then if you look at the potential of large language models, so if you take the use case that we're sort of working at the moment, which is what we call ambient voice technology, so listening to the consultation using a speech-to-text AI model, and then doc creating the documentation from that transcript using a large language model. But what's very interesting is both those technologies, they work out of the box in about 100 languages minimum to a very high standard. And actually, some of them are now stretching up, like MMS from Facebook runs about 1,000 languages very, very well. So we're now creating this potential to actually to flip that sort of ethical consideration on its head a little bit and say, well, we've always tolerated that we just couldn't speak to some of these patients. But why should we now tolerate that when actually the ability to speak to these patients is almost ubiquitously available already today? Yeah, there's some compliance and safety issues to make sure that it's clinically safe for healthcare as a use case. But I think what's fascinating to me is actually rather than saying what new biases does these models introduce, actually start to start really looking at what we've been always doing for the last 50 years and saying, well, actually, is that okay anymore if we now have this technology that supersedes that? And healthcare can be a, a slow industry in that respect. So I think it's about a mindset change. Um, so I'm very actually more interested in how do we address the ethical issues that we already have with this new technology? Um, and I, I don't necessarily see much downside to, to at least the approach that we're taking. Obviously, you need to make sure it generalizes and we do a lot of work making sure, you know, accents, for example, in terms of if you're going to use speech to text AI, are you catering for the right populations? Are they matching what the accents you have locally are? Um, but yeah, I think the, the 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 ethical problems, I guess, that we can now solve, that that's hugely exciting. Thank you. That's fascinating from the point of view. And I remember uh, looking uh, while researching for this discussion, looking at one of your articles and interviews uh, when the head where the headline was uh, uh, it is unethical to not use technology, not to use AI anymore. So I think it's kind of backing up the 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 idea that you that you hear um, presented for for us. Um, and moving on to our next question is, uh, in your role at ORCA, you emphasize aligning digital health with the core values of medicine, including evidence, patient benefit, and rigor. How do you balance the rapid advancements in AI with the need to robust evidence-based practices? And what strategies do you employ to ensure that AI application, applications in health meet the highest standards of patient care and safety? Yeah. Super good question. Um, I would say actually there is no balance, right? There's no balance. And I would say that because evidence-based practice is the bedrock of all medicine. And that's not just to do with the technology. Actually, interestingly, when it comes to sort of healthcare IT, we're really bad at actually applying ev any evidence sort of base. And if you look at, for example, the introduction of electronic healthcare record systems, where is the evidence that that's improved harm, uh, improved safety? Where is the evidence that it hasn't increased harm? And this, I mean, we, we're about to actually publish a study uh, trying to summarize the evidence of electronic healthcare records and their impact on cognitive load on clinicians. But the evidence base is extremely poor, and yet we've seen widespread adoption of the technology. So actually, at Tortoise, we're taking the opposite approach entirely and saying, look, everything that we do needs to demonstrate that it increases uh, in a very scientific and robust way patient safety, accuracy, efficiency of care without introducing new harms. And it's really interesting because to, there's a concept that healthcare is a slow industry for adoption, specifically in technology. But if you actually look at pharma, for example, actually it's not. I, as a physician, would adopt new medicines almost continuously throughout my career. I worked for 10 years as a cardiologist. And the bar for my adoption was extremely high, you know, 10 years of clinical development, five years of clinical trials, and then a very robust clinical trial result. But once that result was there and the guidelines were updated, I would adopt that medicine uh, straight away. And you know, even in my practice, we move from warfarin 
to novel anticoagulants like rivaroxaban. That was a quick, as soon as the evidence came that that was a very quick shift. We started using PSCK9 inhibitors. Like there was very many changes uh, in our practice. Started using new antiplatelet drugs like clopidogrel and prasugrel and ticagrelor. And actually it's fascinating to think that there is a framework for adoption in medicine, very fast, very robustly and at scale. And it's the pharma framework. It's taking a new technology with potentially great harms, like a medicine, through a phase one study where you have sort of minimal risk and you test your basic benefit, a phase two study where you increase the risk, so you're using it in your population, but in a small size, trying to measure benefit, and then a phase three study where you're having maximum risk because it's the target population at scale and you're analyzing the benefits there. And then once you've proved those use cases, then you have the ability to deliver. So that's exactly actually how we've been taking our AI technologies through that, taking that exact same approach. So we've been working with our flagship hospital partnership site over here, which we've recently announced in Great Ormond Street Hospital. And we've been working through the same phase one, phase two, phase three with the AI technology that we've been building um, as a co-pilot for their clinicians. So in the phase one, we built a prototype, no patient data, no clinician data, just a sandbox environment. Once we passed phase one, it sort of proved its value in that concept, moved to phase two, where real clinicians, so six, seven real clinicians and 48 simulated patients, actually patient actors, so very high fidelity simulation, but still simulated. And then proving out the ROI in terms of time, quality of the documentation, the clinician experience and patient experience, but with no risk, right? No patient, no patient data, no cybersecurity risk. And the next stage will be real world patients and real world clinicians. But once you've got to that data point, that's very robust data. Also to take that same process with your compliance, with your cybersecurity, working out the guardrails around the AI system. And that's a really key part of what we've been doing at Tortoise is trying to build the scientific processes for the taxonomy of large language models, but in the clinical space. So there's a really good example of how a lot of this basics doesn't translate is looking at speech to text. So if you look at your speech to text metrics now, the classic uh, way of measuring performance is word error rate. It's very well accepted. However, in the clinical space, that's not particularly useful because the purpose of speech to text AI in this particular use case is not to transcribe the entire consultation word for word. That's almost irrelevant. It's to make sure that you're capturing all the clear clinical entities. So if you had a model which worked perfectly for every word of English, but didn't capture any medical words or any medical symptoms or any medical drugs, it wouldn't work in this use case. So we then had to reinvent a new way of measuring uh, word error rate for the clinical using clinical entities and then validating it with clinician. So we spent a lot of time building these platforms where we can run experiments, identify which models and how they perform clinically, and then actually producing our own taxonomy to then be able to iterate against that. And when we get into hallucinations, which is obviously, or you know, maybe confabulations is a better way to put it for large language models. In the healthcare space, obviously we cannot allow that. So we have to build a guardrail system but then we have to go and create a clinical taxonomy for how do we actually measure and name hallucinations? Where do they come from? What is the clinical impact? What is the significance? What should we try to optimize first? And then we have to balance that against emissions, which is also a big problem if, you know, the best non-hallucinating large language model would have no output at all, no hallucinations, but actually no output, right? So it's a spectrum of how do you then balance that against utility? And, and, and that's always something that we have to very carefully iterate again. And I think what's fascinating is that this is a huge commercial, uh, well, I wouldn't say advantage, but certainly a huge commercial insight. Because what we can do now as a company is I can put two models together and I can say for our specific use case, this model is 5% better than this use case, which actually for large language models is a very hard thing to be able to do. And then that allows us to rapidly iterate and create a framework where we can demonstrate safety to our customers, but also evaluate our vendors. And being in the middle as an application layer it's really, really important that we can do both of those things very, very well. And that allows us then to produce a safety case and say, look, we're, we're bringing AI into the real world with this framework. These are our internal tests and internal experiments and metrics, and this is how we're producing this data. And the principle of healthcare IT is that we produce, you know, a vendor produces a software system, evaluates it internally, presents that data to a customer, like a hospital system, who then evaluates that data, then accepts it. And that's the process that we have in the UK. So again, adopting existing processes for AI is the way to do that. Um, and I think that's something that's very nascent, specifically in the AI healthcare space, when you get to clinician-facing applications like this, 
But I think all of the frameworks are just, are already there. We just need to apply them. And actually, to be honest, we don't really even need to adapt them very significantly. We can use the same case control frameworks. We can use the same uh, patient uh, consent and study evaluation frameworks that we have for pharma um, and implement. And as the evidence base builds and as you know confidence builds in the technology, I think this will be you know how the actual implementation of this technology gets done. And then, you know, to go to the last point you said about rapid advancements in AI, mm -hmm. it's really funny. We've well past the point of needing to build anything else for like the next 10 years in healthcare in terms of the technology, because we're so far behind in terms of implementation. And it's, I mean, it's really interesting. So I was pitching to a hospital uh, only a few months ago, uh, talking about our AI co-pilot. And they were like, oh, that's great, but we're still on paper. <laughs> so like you have to also appreciate that healthcare as an industry is such a wide spectrum of digital maturity that some of it it's like a little bit like you know the gold rush in the US uh, and you imagine everyone's going west but actually no one can get past the Rocky Mountains like the west coast is still there uh, and that's paper based so it's a really interesting uh, journey on that respect as well is to, is to kind of understand that actually the, the race here is not the technology and it's not even to implement it because half of it is impossible it's actually to figure out how to do this safely. I think the the winners in this space will actually be the ones that have the safety and the compliance case down, the guardrails bill. And we're sort of currently figuring out how to do that. And then the plan will be to automate and the plan will be actually then to build that into product in as an automatic way. And I think that's one of the really fantastic uh, and new uh, capacities of AI technology is the ability eventually potentially to self-monitor. And I think that's a fascinating uh, place to start, really, um, in implementing this technology as a, as a, you know, as a as a rapid priority. Thank you. So no shortcuts when it comes to safety, and I love the I love the the way of taking what pharma has already developed over the years, their process of introducing new drugs. And taking it to 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 our sphere, to to the technology and digital health. That's that that was that's really that's really interesting. And moving on, my last question to you uh, might be from a different side, but I guess it will be definitely super interesting. Uh, as me as a doctor, I was also looking for such informations in the past when I was choosing my career path. So, as a clinician turned entrepreneur in the AI health. Uh, tech space, what advice would you give to healthcare professionals interested in embracing technology and entrepreneurship, particularly in navigating the transition from current clinical roles to leadership positions in innovative companies like Tortoise? Mm -hmm. That's a super good question. So I think I, I think I'll break it down a little bit. So like there's the clinician piece and there's the entrepreneur piece. So for the clinician piece, do not change. And I think that's really, that's a really interesting, because what I observe is a lot of people think, you know, I've got my medical degree, I'm a clinician, and I'm just going to go full hog into pharma or into entrepreneurship or into tech or whatever it might be. But the problem with that mentality is you lose a lot of the insights that you have almost instantly. And therefore, you don't really appreciate that your utility, you know, you, you if you go too early, you haven't even really made decisions or understood workflows, which is super useful to tech in general. So I'm actually even now keeping my hand in. I still work while well, trying to work as much as I can clinically, like a shift a month or something. A, because I want to keep validated for my license, but B, just to basically keep my hand in the water and understand what is actually happening. What are people thinking? What are the problems? Because actually that's the value of technology is to solve the problems. If you don't know the problems, then you're you know, quite far abstracted. So I think I'd be really careful about people wanting to jump uh, and, and and leaving behind any sort of clinical roots because then actually you're, you're, you're thinking about a very different career path. And I actually have colleagues that have retrained entirely. They've abandoned clinical and they've retrained as data scientists or machine learning engineers, and that's how they've made the jump. So kind of like you have to understand what, what role are you thinking of going to be? Because if it's clinical, you should stay clinical. I think the other thing that people underappreciate is the skills that they already have. So people think, oh... You know, being a doctor is one thing, jumping into an in being an entrepreneur in a company is something completely different. And I was like, actually, no, it isn't. And I had this funny realization that, you know, when we first started the company, funnily enough, a year ago, exactly today is our, so it's our one year anniversary today. Um, we, we were pitching the company, you know, pitching for investment and pitching for all sorts of like customers and stuff. We're getting a lot of feedback about pitching and I was thinking, 
oh goodness like this is a new skill I don't know how to pitch something I don't know how to sell like I need to learn this from scratch and then I was about halfway through the 10th pitch that wasn't going very well I suddenly was like hold on I'm explaining something very complex to people that don't have an innate understanding of it which is highly important I have to relay that importance to them I know how to do this I've done this my whole life like I just used so I started using the same uh, techniques that we get taught in medical comm skills signposting breaking things down checking understanding involved like what have you been told so far about tortoise it's exactly the same as what do you understand about your diagnosis so far it's exactly the same skill set and when it comes to managing people you know you've already managed teams if you've been senior you've managed junior doctors you've managed nurses you've managed multidisciplinary teams so the skill sets that you have are already pretty well developed and actually, funnily enough, one of the skill sets that I now rely on very heavily is something that I had in medical school and I actually lost for most of my career as a doctor, which was rapid learning. So when you're in medical school, you know, you take a new exam every four months, right? I mean, you've done the same thing. Right. Constantly inhaling textbooks and spitting out exam results for six years or whatever the train. I think you guys are longer, actually, uh, if you trained over in Poland. Six years. Yeah, it's six years as well. But I mean, it, it, so the, the muscle, the cognitive muscle is very well developed. And then you start practicing and no one teaches you anything uh, for about six years. It's all almost experiential. So relearning that as a muscle, actually, you know, I've had to pick up all sorts of nonsense, governance, compliance, machine learning. Mm. You said I'm a keen Python developer. I'd emphasize more on keen as opposed to actual developer. <laughs> like, I give it a go. But interesting, like, even learning coding has been such a, a interesting learning curve. Very, very hard at the beginning. And now... Actually, those, uh, you know, those skills come in useful just that when people talk to me about code, at least I understand the principles. So I think constant learning is super important and, and actually very translatable to the to the entrepreneurship side. And then how do you get into entrepreneurship? I think one of the most interesting insights is like doctors have a tendency to plan and then to do. And I would actually flip that on its said, uh, if you want to be an entrepreneur, the right way to do it is to do and then to plan based on the results of how badly that you did. So I think one of the biggest mindset changes is as a clinician, you, you do not tolerate failure, right? You try to avoid failure mm -hmm. or cost because it's not that industry. But in entrepreneurship, you really want to run to failure as fast as possible to learn. And I think that's one of the biggest insights. And when I look back at my career, I did a whole bunch of stuff before I became an entrepreneur in the in the truest sense of the word. But actually, if I look back, I was always like doing random things like I'm producing, you know, had a video campaign and then founded a charity and then right, ran a social media and then wrote a book. And like I never managed to like commit to any of those projects, but actually all of them taught me in lots of different ways, a whole bunch of skills which I now use and have learned. But I think the number one thing was like persistence, deliver, fail, repeat, right? Try, fail, repeat is actually it's in my name on my blog. Um, and I think that bit, is something that you can start now. If you wanted to get into entrepreneurship, then just literally try to start anything. It doesn't even matter what it is. It might be a project in your hospital. It might be uh, an advisory role. It might be a company. It might be doing data labeling. I mean, I open invite to any clinicians listening that want to come and do data labeling for us because we have a platform that's super useful, but it, it gets you in the door. And you might find that, you know, that action begets more actions, which begets more actions. You meet people. And then, you know, you find yourself in a position. So the way I found myself in this role, like if I roll back, like, I don't know, about a million uh, turns of the dice, I think I started trying to build something just for fun. I showed it to someone. They're like, oh, that's pretty good. You should meet my friend. Met that person's friend. They said, oh, you should apply to this accelerator. Didn't get into that accelerator, but got rejected and matched with somebody else. They were like, I used to be in this accelerator. Do you want to try that? got into that accelerator, met Chris, founded the company, and here we are. So it's all, you know, action begets action. So I think the honest answer is, if you want to get into entrepreneurship, just begin, just start, just start doing something, start doing anything and don't give up. And I think that's the other part that people forget that everything is just learning until you give up and then it's failure, right? And if you stop, <laughs> you failed. But if you're then carrying on, then actually, you know, you're succeeding just by the long way around, which is actually how everybody succeeds. Uh, you know, anyone that said, you know, I, I was an overnight success is just lying because behind them mm -hmm. is a decade of failures before they got to that point. I can 100% guarantee you that. Um, so, yeah, so that's my, you know, two tips there. Great words. Thank you for that. And what to add here like be persistent and be keen to learn new things because 
well, what I experienced in the past was, you know, I was just close in my role as a medical doctor mm -hmm. and not, not knowing that I can break, uh, break the, break the walls and be outside of this world as well, like be a doctor and mm -hmm. be someone else at the same time. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the answer to this question. Um, it's a wrap for us. Uh, thank you for a discussion. Thank you for um, having a coffee with me, although it's water here, sorry. <laughs> but uh, but, um, uh, but thank you for the conversation and hope to see you soon. Thanks so much. Thanks for inviting. Bye-bye.